Hello, I'm Bernie Norcott Mahaney, and I am speaking to you from the Nelson Atkin Art Museum. On National Great Poetry Day, uh, I will be reading six great odes uh, by John Keats. But to start, I'd like to start with a poem of Keats that I'm fond of and that I have to memory. It's entitled, On First Looking Into Chapman's Homer. Uh, when Keats was a young man, he was, in a, he was a teenager, um, a teacher of his uh, invited him over uh, for an afternoon of reading uh, Homer um, in George Chapman's English translation, uh, which is a pretty impressive translation. It's the first uh, complete translation uh, of Homer into English we have. Um, and um, Keats, who didn't know Greek, he didn't have sort of the the upper class schooling that some of his contemporaries did um, could only appreciate Homer through English. So <clears throat> he remembered this event and uh, celebrated it in this poem. So on first looking into Chapman's Homer by John Keats. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western isles have I been which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demean. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific, and all his men gazed at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. Ode on a Grecian Urn Thou still unravished bride of quietness, Thou foster child of silence and slow time, Sylvan historian who canst thus express A flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme, What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape Of deities or mortals, or of both, In Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore ye soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth, beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal. Yet do not grieve, she cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss. Forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love, more happy happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young, all breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowed and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leadst thou that heifer lowing at the skies, and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town, by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk, this pious morn. And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O oh, attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form, dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity. Cold pastoral, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. John Keats' Ode on Indolence. They toil not, neither do they spin. One morn before me were three figures seen with bowed necks and jointed hands side-faced, 
and one behind the other stepped serene in placid sandals and in white robes graced. They passed like figures on a marble urn when shifted round to see the other side. They came again as when the urn once more is shifted round, the first seen sh shades return. And they were strange to me, as may betide with vase, vases, to one deep in Phidian lore. How is it, shadows, that I knew ye not? How came ye muffled in so hush a mask? Was it a silent, deep-disguised plot to steal away and leave without a task my idle days? Ripe was the drowsy hour, the blissful cloud of summer indolence benumbed my eyes. My pulse grew less and less, pain had no sting, and pleasure's wreath no flower. Oh, why did ye not melt and leave my sense unhaunted quite a bit, but nothingness? A third time passed they by, and passing turned each one the face a moment whiles to me, then faded, and to follow them I burned and ached for wings because I knew the three. The first was a fair maid, and love her name. The second was ambition, pale of cheek and ever watchful with fatigued eye. The last, whom I love more, the more of blame is heaped upon her, maiden most unmeek, I knew to be my demon, poesy. They faded, and forsooth I wanted wings. Oh, folly, what is love, and where is it? And for that poor ambition, it springs from a man's little heart's short fever fit. For poesy, no, she has not a joy, at least for me, so sweet as drowsy noons and evenings steeped in honeyed insol insolence. Oh, for an age so sheltered from annoy that I may never know how change the moons or hear the voice of busy common sense. And once more came they by, alas, wherefore? My sleep had been embroidered with dim dreams, my soul had been a lawn, besprinkled o'er with flowers and stirring shades and baffled beams. The morn was clouded, but no shower fell, though in her lids hung the sweet tears of May. The open casement pressed a new-leaved vine, let in the budding warmth and throstles lay. O oh, shadows, t'was a time to bid farewell, upon your skirts had fallen no tears of mine. So. Ye three ghosts, adieu. Ye cannot raise my head cool bedded in the flowery grass, for I would not be dieted with praise, a pet lamb in a sentimental farce. Fade softly from my eyes and be once more in mask-like figures on the dreamy urn. Farewell. I yet have visions for the night and for the day, faint visions there is store. Vanish, ye phantoms, for my idle sprite into the clouds and nevermore return. John Keats, Ode on Melancholy. No, no, go not to Lethe, neither twist wolf's bane, tight rooted for its poisonous wine, nor suffer thy pale forehead to be kissed by nightshade, ruby grape of proserpine. Make not your rosary of yew berries, nor let the beetle nor the death moth be your mournful psyche, nor the downy owl a partner in your sorrow's mysteries. For shade to shade will come too drowsily and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. But when the melancholy fit shall fall sudden from, a, from heaven like a weeping cloud that fosters the droop-headed flowers all and hides the green hill in an April shroud, then glut thy sorrow on the salt sand wave or, or on the wealth of globed peonies. Or if thy mistress some rich anger shows, imprison her soft hand and let her rave and feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. She dwells with beauty, beauty that must die, and joy whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu. An aching pleasure nigh, turning to poison while the bee mouth sips, aye, in the very temple of delight veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine though seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine. His soul shall taste the sadness of her might and be among her cloudy trophies hung. So that Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats. My heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and leafy words had sunk. 
tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cool the long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and Provencal song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrene, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen, and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Fade far away dissolve, and quite forget what thou amongst the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret here, what where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs, where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies, where but to think t is to be full of sorrow and leaded eyed despairs where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy. Though the dull brain perplexes and retards, already with thee, tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays, but here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, but in embalmed darkness. Yes, each sweet, wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild. White hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid-May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves. Darkling, I listened, and for many a time I have been in, half in love with easeful death, called him soft names in many a mused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now, more than ever, seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain to thy high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown, perhaps the selfsame song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth, when sick for home she stood in tears among the alien corn. That same that oft times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas and fairy lands forlorn. Forlorn. The word is like a bell to tow me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu. The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu. Adieu. Thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? John Keats, Ode to Psyche. O oh, goddess, Hear these tuneless numbers rung by sweet enforcement and remembrance dear, and pardon that thy secrets should be sung even into thine own soft conched ear. Surely I dreamt today, or did I see the winged psyche with awakened eyes? I wandered in a forest thoughtlessly, and on the sudden, fainting with surprise, saw two fair creatures couched side by side in deepest grass beneath the whispering roof of leaves and trembled blossoms where there ran a brooklet scarce espied. Mid-hushed, cool-rooted flowers, fragrant-eyed, blue, silver-white, and budded Tyrian, there lay, calm breathing on the bedded grass, their arms embraced, and their pinions too. Their lips touched not, but had not bad, bad adieu, as if disjoined by soft-handed slumber, and ready still past kisses to outnumber, at tender eye dawn of Aurorian love, the winged boy I knew. But who wast thou, O happy, happy dove? 
his psyche true. Of latest born and loveliest vision far on all Olympus's faded hierarchy. Fairer than Phoebe's saf sapphire region star or Vesper, amorous glowworm of the sky. Fairer than these, though temple thou hast none, nor altar heaped with flowers, nor virgin choir to make delicious moan upon the midnight hours. No voice, no lute, no pipe, no incense sweet from chain swung censer teeming, no shrine, no grove, no oracle, no heat of pale mouthed prophet dreaming. O oh, brightest, though too late for antique vows, too, too late for the fond believing liar, when holy were the haunted forest boughs, holy the air, the water, and the fire. Yet even in these days so far retired from happy pieties, thy loosened fans, fluttering among the faint Olympians I see and sing, by my own eyes inspired. So let me be thy choir and make a moan upon the midnight hours, thy voice, thy lute, thy pipe, thy incense sweet, from swinged censer teeming, thy shrine, thy grove, thy oracle, thy heat of pale-mouthed prophet dreaming. Yes, I will be thy priest and build a fane in some untrodden region of my mind, where branched thoughts, new grown with pleasant pain, instead of pines shall murmur in the wind. Far, far around shall those dark clustered trees fledge the wild ridged mountain steep by steep, and there by zephyrs, streams and birds and bees, the moss-laying dryad shall be lulled to sleep. And in the midst of this wide quietness, a rosy sanctuary will I dress with the wreathed trellis of a working brain, with buds and bells and stars without a name, with all the gardener fancy air could feign, who breeding flowers will ne'er breed the same. And there shall be for thee all soft delight that shadowy thought can win, a bright torch, and a casement open at night to let warm love in. John Keats to Autumn. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the moss cottage trees, all and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core to dwell the gourd, swell the gourd, and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, to set buddy more, and still more, later flowers for the bees, until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen these oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or on a heap reaped half-reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twining flowers. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across the brook, or by a cider press with patient look, thou watchest the late, last oozings hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Ay, where are they? Think not of them. Thou hast thy music too, while barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue, then in a wailful choir the small gnats mourn among the river sallows borne aloft of, or sinking as the light wind lives or dies, and full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly born, hedge crickets sing, and now with a treble soft the red breast whistles from a garden croft and gathering swallows twitter in the skies.